if you think you will never personally encounter disaster, you may be very wrong. For there is no immunity from disaster, no place safe enough to be out of its reach. Take this rolling California countryside. It looks innocent enough until you consider that beneath it lies the San Andreas Fault. But the people who live here don't think much about that. After all, they, like all of us, have more pressing, urgent problems. But then that was also the case back in 1933. Southern California is in the pit of the Depression. People are hungry and without shelter. Their spirits broken. Their existence dependent upon bread lines and soup kitchens. Things are bad everywhere. The unemployed pour in looking for jobs that don't exist. The only escape from the bleakness of depression reality comes with a 15 cent movie ticket. Close your eyes a minute. Close them. Now open. Pretty, huh? Yeah. Two bucks a day for this. All I have to do is walk up and down and turn the light on and off. The motion picture industry flourishes, and Hollywood becomes a world of dreams and fantasies. A world so near, and yet so far, where rising stars capture the country's imagination. The studios are busy, and on this March 10th, they prepare to shoot a scene with W.C. Fields. At 5.45 p.m., with the cameras rolling, the world of make-believe is about to become one of terrifying reality. And action. Young man, you probably saved my life. Now what can I do for you? Take us to Shanghai. Shanghai? Yeah. What's the matter? only 11 seconds, but covers 75,000 square miles. In Long Beach alone, 21,000 homes fall prey to its force. 15 solid blocks of the business district are reduced to rubble. Seven minutes later, there's a second shock. Within an hour, seven shocks are to rock Southern California. Pain and suffering are everywhere. Amid new tremors that rock and shake operating tables, surgeons and nurses work without sleep for more than 72 hours, always fearful of when the next shock will hit. Communication and power are virtually destroyed. Only police teletype lines and radio stations can reach the outside world. The call goes out for help. The Navy lands 2,000 sailors and Marines. Soldiers and the National Guard are mobilized. <laughs> Food supplies are brought in, and the search for the missing and injured goes on. As night falls, the homeless watch as rescue teams search the debris for survivors. Hollywood has sent lights, and operations go on around the clock. The buildings are unstable, and the work is dangerous. The throngs that gather can only stand helplessly by, praying that missing friends and loved ones may have somehow survived. By midnight, there had been 34 shocks. The homeless and the destitute seek refuge atop the San Pedro Hills, wondering when it will end, why it had to be their city, and what quirk of fate separated them from friends and relatives still buried by the rubble. The following day, the search for the missing goes on, and the toll of injured and dead rises. Cleanup operations begin. What remains standing is unstable and dangerous. It has to be brought down.
120 people have lost their lives in one of the most destructive quakes in the country's history. Only the timing of the quake, 5.54 p.m., keeps the death toll from being higher. For school buildings are among the worst hit. Luckily, the children were not in them. As new laws are promised for quake-resistant buildings, man with unyielding resolution starts to rebuild. He now plans to be more cautious. He has seen the awesome force of nature. Aid for the survivors arrives from all over the country. Food lines and first aid stations are set up. Volunteer groups supply clothing and a new spirit of hope prevails. There are small miracles, and a few know the joy of finding a loved one alive. And while it's over now, the sea of rubble becomes a grim reminder of what they've been through. The city would be rebuilt, memories would fade. But beneath the Earth's surface, the faults are still there, waiting for their next victims. By 1964, Alaska isn't thinking much about earthquakes. Anchorage is crawling out of another northern winter, and it looks to be a boom year for the nation's largest state. It's Good Friday afternoon. Most of the city's 48,000 people are getting ready for the Easter weekend. Then, at 5.38 p.m., earthquake to strike North America in this century. Homes have been tossed around like matchboxes. Buildings have been twisted. And the streets of Anchorage have collapsed, leaving gaping holes and stranded automobiles. For Anchorage, the worst is over. For others, it's just beginning. In the tiny coastal towns of Seward and Valdez, oil tanks catch fire ignited by broken electrical wires. And then word comes of tidal waves sweeping southward from the Aleutian Islands. worked like a powerful jackhammer, flattening everything in its path. A proud, determined people band together and rise to meet the greatest challenge in their history. 115 people have lost their lives. Cities lie in ruin, and the memories are painful. It was a disaster that gave no warning. Its victims were marked by fate. But sometimes disasters do give ominous warnings, and sometimes the warnings are ignored. It's a warm August morning in 1969. Gulf Coast residents and tourists are escaping the heat. It's a time for pleasure. 
but not for everyone. Weathermen have been receiving reports that bring mounting concern. 500 miles south of the Yucatan Peninsula, hot and cold air masses and high temperatures have combined to produce a vortex. A hurricane is in the making. Looking down from space, a pinwheel of fantasy forms and takes the name Camille. She's the third hurricane of the season, and like her sisters, she's to be a very unpredictable lady. A weather reconnaissance plane nears the eye of the hurricane to assess its movement and strength. Go ahead, it's a dangerous uh, sight. Signal, Roger. Uh, this is the penetration heading. High as again. Inside the whirling vortex lies an almost serene calm. Here, the storm cooks. Fed by rising, moisture-laden air and given spin by the Earth's rotation, it creates its own momentum. Slowly, it starts to move. Already the crew is worried. They've seen hurricanes building before, but nothing like this. Their instruments confirm the worst. Camille is big, powerful, and is now moving in the direction of the Gulf Coast. The hurricane is tracked toward the Mississippi-Louisiana coastline, and the warnings go out. People take heed. Over 150,000 pack up and get out. Some don't. They've been through hurricanes before, they say. It's part of the accepted price for living in paradise. The forces of nature become an irresistible challenge, a break in the routine, a new thrill. The surf has never been so up, and the few can't resist the temptation. They take to the water, oblivious to the mounting danger. For some, it will be their last swim. By now, weather forecasters know this is not to be just any hurricane. Camille is showing herself as a giant, moving to strike the coast with all her fury. With the winds rising, the water level reaches the high tide mark. the hurricane still out to sea. Reports come in that her winds are reaching over 280 miles an hour, the highest ever recorded. Weathermen begin to worry about the kind of water the winds are pushing and just how far inland she will reach. By early evening, one thing is apparent. Camille isn't stopping, and the worst is yet to come. of coast between Gulfport and Biloxi, called by some the Riviera of the South, is underwater. Now residents of inland states start to worry. Will they be next? People do what they can, laboring through the night, confident that the worst is over. But it isn't.
By morning, Camille has finally spent her fury, but not before roaring north through Tennessee, crossing the Blue Ridge Mountains, and then moving into the Atlantic. She has cut an awesome path of destruction, hurling small boats far inland and leaving larger ones high and dry. Property damages are estimated at over a billion dollars. Other damages aren't so easily assessed. It's bound to be in here somewhere because all these are the houses that came from in this vicinity. They're all ready in here in this neighborhood. But mine was right on the corner, not on All you have left is your dog? That's right. I'm gonna hang on to her. I'm gonna hang on to her. The man on the second floor, he had a drink, and he told me to come on up and join the party that they were gonna stay on the third floor, and I told him, no, this was too serious. Five couples had a, a hurricane party, and uh, some of our, some of the friends that uh, lived here were over here looking for their friends that were in the party, and they can't be found. Russian with the water. Yes, I have a brother and sister, but we, we're looking for them right now. 258 people are dead. Over 400,000 are homeless. Some will pick up the pieces and start rebuilding. For others, the memories are too powerful. They decide to pack up and move inland, where they will be out of reach of future hurricanes. And Junior, darling, we all are right, sweetheart. I love you. Now, don't worry about us. We all right, darling. And hello to all of you. Thank the Lord. Another one will never catch us here because if we hear of another one coming, we're leaving here and go way upstate like you asked Mama to do. So, okay, now I love y'all. But is there any place truly out of reach of disaster? Certainly the residents of Xenia, Ohio thought so. After all, their quiet, shaded streets and friendly business section were in the heart of America. But on April 3rd, 1974, there came growing cause for alarm. The winds were rising, the barometer falling. The weathermen watched and waited. The cruel forces of nature were again at work. Conditions were just right for a tornado. We'll keep you posted as we get further information from the United States Weather Bureau. The severe weather forecast is in effect and will remain in effect until 8 o'clock tonight. Let's take a look now at these clouds as they are forming in the distance. This is looking toward the west-northwest of the Channel 6 studios. You can see a great deal of turbulence in these clouds. They're dipping, falling, rising once again. Now, now we have another uh, appearance of a funnel. Yeah. Can you swing around and get that, please? Increasing in force, the twister moves erratically towards Xenia. With winds at its center reaching over 500 miles an hour, the twister, like a gigantic drill, starts through Xenia. frantically look for whatever cover they can find, but some are caught in the open. cuts a half-mile swath of random destruction, sparing some buildings, disintegrating others. By the 
time it reaches the residential area, its fury is awesome. Nothing in its path escapes destruction. People are helpless against its fury. While most people take what shelter they can find, a few gamble with their lives. moves away from Xenia, but it is only one of over a hundred twisters that attack 11 states that day, claiming 300 victims. We lost everything we had. But until you've lived through it and seen the real thing, you just have no idea. We got in the car and went home, I thought it'd be the safest place, but when I got in the door, the house fell in on us. Over 2,000 homes are destroyed. Some of the debris is carried 200 miles north before being dropped from the sky. In Xenia, 1,000 people are injured, but miraculously, only 28 lose their lives. Some called it the finger of God, others the tail of the devil. No one could remember anything like it. Later, no one wanted to remember. What had once been bore little resemblance to what remained standing. Surveying what was once one's home became a painful experience shared by many. 85% of the town was gone, reduced to rubble in just 15 minutes. Xenia, Ohio was no longer the quiet, safe little town everybody thought it was, nor was it the only town to ever live in the shadow of disaster. In Fanazzo, Sicily, the soil is made rich from the lava of nearby Mount Etna. The natives called the mountain Bonaccioni, the big, good-natured fellow. But in April 1971, the good-natured fellow came alive and turned mean. the insatiable monster is not going to stop. The local residents watch helplessly as their precious vineyards are destroyed. They have no choice but to pack up their belongings and move out. like a gigantic bulldozer pushes forward at the rate of a quarter mile a day. As the lava attacks their homes, the local peasants watch helplessly.
tourists line the road to gape at the advancing wall of fiery lava. Then they, too, are forced to retreat. Nothing can stop the monster. left in its wake a surface as barren as the moon. There will be no grapes, no wine for a long time to come. And they have learned, sadly, that there is no place truly safe from disaster. But disaster is not the sole province of nature. Man, in reaching for his triumphs over the elements, creates his own potential for disaster. The idea of life being sabered close to death spawned the daredevil, and the race was on to see who could find the most spectacular way to risk his neck. His imagination was boundless. He found a special appeal in high places and in meeting obstacles head on. It didn't seem to matter that nothing much was accomplished by the daredevil. The main thing was to attract attention. The sillier the stunts, the better. So far, it was only his neck he was risking. Along with defiant daredevils came those inventive pioneers of early flight. They combined the spirit of the daredevil with the determination of the inventor and a new kind of disaster was in the making. Man tried imitating a bird and a thrashing machine, all without much success. His creations were original, if not practical. Some were overwhelming in their size and scope, while others were just plain silly. But they all contained the elements of disaster. Whether man flew by the seat of his pants, or simply tried to sail from a lock. Man finally managed to get himself off the ground, and then the trouble really began. The daredevil was quick to take to the air in search of new thrills. Now the stakes were getting higher. Three people could risk their lives as easily as one. The balloon seemed to offer more promise as a safe, reliable means of getting aloft. In the 1930s, Auguste Picard took his balloon into the realm of serious science. He was to reach over 13 miles, and a new word was coined, stratosphere. The 20th century was the season for lighter-than-air travel. The gas bag was stretched, and the dirigible was born. Tail fins were added. Engines were attached. By 1922, non-explosive helium replaced the dangerous hydrogen, and the dirigible safety record became as impressive as its performance. The dirigible could be maneuvered with such accuracy, a new class of mail service was instituted from the mast of the Empire State Building, direct to all the ships at sea. The U.S. Navy airship Akron was so large it had room aboard for two small planes that could drop off or hook on in midair. But the Akron was to become a jinx, perhaps an omen. Attempting to land after a trouble-plagued cross-country flight, a sudden gust of wind took her aloft, with three men still clutching her lines. two hours before the captain could bring the ship down with the sole survivor. In 
37, the most elegant airship ever built, was readied for her 18th transatlantic crossing. The Hindenburg was the pride of Nazi Germany and the largest dirigible ever made. On May 3rd, 1937, she left Frankfurt for a three-day Atlantic crossing. One of the passengers was Joseph Spa, an acrobat by trade. I am Joseph Spa. For 45 years, I have been an acrobat and almost made my life with a dangerous act called the lamppost climber. had played his act to audiences around the world. Now, for the first time, he had a booking in the United States. He decided to travel in the safety and comfort of the mighty Hindenburg. She was 804 feet long and stood as tall as a 10-story building. She could cruise at 84 miles per hour and cross the Atlantic in 76 hours. She had 70 staterooms, 50 of those with private baths, whose water supply was distilled from the air in flight. Her spacious interiors provided luxurious accommodations. Four chefs prepared elaborate continental meals, lobsters, steaks, roasts, and fowl, while a crew of 61 catered to the every whim of the Hindenburg's 91 passengers. Food was prepared in specially designed electric stoves, and the wine list offered many of Germany's finest wines. At a price of $400 one way, the passengers were provided with entertainment and dancing, and an experienced crew who worked with the most up-to-date equipment. There was only one thing the Hindenburg wasn't provided with, helium. The United States was the sole source of a non-explosive gas, and its sale to Germany was forbidden. Consequently, the Hindenburg was carrying more than seven million cubic feet of dangerous, highly flammable hydrogen gas. Every precaution was taken to avoid a spark. Catwalks and ladders were coated with rubber. The crew wore special clothing to avoid static electricity, and smoking materials were confiscated from passengers. Consequently, the people on board felt themselves safe, relaxed in the knowledge of these precautions, as well as the Hindenburg's perfect safety record. After all, she didn't face the threat that posed a continuing danger to surface ships at sea. No risk of angry seas or icebergs. Approaching the coast, passenger Joseph Spa got his first look at New York. We came along Long Island Sound and then of course on New York, which was to me the most thrilling thing. After cruising around New York, we made for Lake Hurst and the skies became a little dark. passengers aboard the Hindenburg, a contingent of reporters, and a radio announcer named Herb Morrison. How do you do, everyone? We're greeting you now from the Naval Air Base at Lake Hurst, New Jersey, from which point we're going to bring you a description of the landing of the mammoth airship Hindenburg, which was due here in America this morning at dawn, completing the first chance of landing crossing of the 1937 season. Well, here it comes, ladies and gentlemen, and what a great sight it is, a thrilling one, it's a marvelous sight. It's coming down out of the sky, pointed directly towards us and toward the mooring mast. The ship is riding majestically toward us like some great feather, riding as though it was mighty the proud of place playing in the world's aviation. The ship is no doubt busting the activities we ain't the orders are shouted to the crew, the passengers are pumped and lining the windows looking down the field ahead of the mooring, getting a glimpse of the mooring mast. There were people below waving up to us, and I thought with what I could see was my wife and children, and I put the camera against my eye, 
and try to take a picture of it. It's practically standing still now. They've got ropes out of the nose of the ship. It's been taken a hold up down on the field by a number of men. It's starting to rain again. It's, the rain had uh, cracked up a little bit. They backed motors to the ship are just holding it. window and I started to climb out. My left leg caved in as I hit the ground. I was trying to crawl away and uh, then I saw this big man. He came running toward me, picked me up, dragged me clear, ran with me and then threw me down on the ground. I raced down to the burning ship. I met a man coming out a day Dave, he couldn't find his way. I grabbed a hold of him. So Mr. Spay, it sounds like Spay, we're not sure of it. And he told me he jumped. He jumped with other passengers. I knew that I was very fortunate. Right? And I say that thanks to God that he spared me for now. The only thing I can do say that I don't know, it all happened so fast. There isn't much to figure about. I do think that I'm very lucky that I'm sitting home here in my own home again after this experience this afternoon. And as I said before, I'm just happy. Escaping with your life should be enough to make anyone happy. Yet some have preferred to risk theirs for a share of glory and thrills. come into its own, and with it a new challenge was born. Even then, at speeds approaching 100 miles an hour, trouble waited around every turn. By 1955, auto racing had become the world's number one spectator sport. And on this unlucky June 13th at Le Mans, France, the spectator was to suffer right along with the daredevil. Seven persons were to lose their lives in the worst crash in auto racing history. While abutments, fences, and banked turns were added to the race course, the cars became faster and more deadly. Speedway, Mecca for speed merchants. A two and a half mile oval track with specially banked turns. Racing had graduated to a science and the throng had gathered to watch its achievements. 
Man's racing machine had become more sophisticated. It was sleeker and faster. It boasted engines of over 700 horsepower and speeds approaching 200 miles per hour. Its 80-gallon tanks were filled with methanol, pure methyl alcohol, a highly flammable compound as lethal as it is potent. Approaching 200 miles per hour, no part of man's machine was totally safe. Sometimes things just let go. Those who savored life close to death went on ignoring the danger right up to 1973. That was the year Andy Granatelli brought three of the fastest machines ever designed to Indy and three of the best drivers, including Swede Savage and Gordon Johncock. Savage is the bright hope for his team. He turns out for his qualifying heat in the Red Eagle Offenhauser, number 40. Finishing a year of hospital care after a crash at the Ontario Speedway, this will be his year at Indy. A seasoned driver at 26, he is known for stretching the limits of both track and machine. His best lap is clocked at 197 miles per hour, and he wins the coveted pole position. Teammate Gordon Johncock also qualifies, but veteran Art Pollard is not so lucky. Pollard is killed. Widely loved and respected, his loss will later be regarded as an omen. Race day dawns bright, if not clear. The fastest field in the history of the track awaits a crowd of 350,000 fans. The pre-race hoopla goes off on schedule. Pollard's death has been put aside as an unfortunate accident in the past. The darkening skies bring on and off rains. The race is delayed. The crowds are restless. Finally, after a four-hour wait, the weather breaks. The officials give the go-ahead. There's an air of mounting tension built by the competitive spirit. The stakes are high. Money and glory await the victor. The business of racing begins. Carter waves the green flag and the cars leap into the race. Saltwalter's collision with the wire mesh fence spewed burning fuel onto the crowd. A dozen spectators are injured. drizzle turns into a downpour, and officials finally call for the red flag. A race that normally takes one day now moves into its second day. But again, the weather threatens. During the pace lap, rain starts to fall, and the cars are forced to follow the pace car to the red flag.
third day is gray, but so far dry. Less than half the fans wait through five uncertain hours to early afternoon. Then, with the roar of the powerful engines, the events of the past few days seem settled. Somehow, the jinx is lifted. Pollard's death is in the past. Walter is hurt, but okay. And the race is finally on. Anticipation and tension in the air, for the weather looks like it may finally hold. Spectators and drivers alike are eager for the race and for a victor. Smoke signals trouble on the third turn, but the only casualty is a burnt out engine. And the pace car leaves the field to the racers. Bobby Unser in a white eagle takes the early lead. His brother Al is also in the race. Second lap, Robbie Ellison, star of the Southern Stock Car Circuit, is forced out of the race with engine trouble. On the fourth lap, Peter Revson slides into a wall. Miraculously, he survives. By the ninth lap, Smith Savage has moved into third place with an average speed of 180 miles an hour. He turns in for a pit stop for fuel and a fresh pair of right side tires, the ones that receive the most wear on bank turns. In record time, his crew has the car ready to roll. Teammate Gordon Johncock in number 20 is now in third place. The pit stop has dropped Savage back. Savage has overtaken John Cock and is threatening the new leader, Al Unser. But at turn number four, Savage loses control. Seconds later, fire engines race for the track along with mechanic Armand Turan. Turan is hit by the fire truck and the tragedy is compounded. will hang on a month before the race takes its final toll. But Tehran is dead on arrival at the hospital. When rain finally halts the spectacle, John Cock is declared the winner. New safety standards are proposed. But for those who gambled and lost, they were to come too late. It is one thing to gamble with your life and lose it. It is quite another to never know you are gambling at all until it's too late. The passengers who took the luxury liner Andrea Doria in July 1958 were looking forward to all that the brochure promised. That she will provide her passengers with an experience that will somehow be different. One they will never forget as long as they live. On July 25th, only a day away from docking in New York, the passengers are enjoying themselves and are looking forward to their last night at sea. morning, the Swedish liner Stockholm leaves New York. She boasts a specially reinforced bow design to break through heavy ice. By mid-afternoon, the Andrea Doria hits fog. To her 
their passengers, the foghorn adds a note of romance to the last night out. With darkness, the Andrea Doria's captain decides to cut the ship's speed slightly, again according to normal procedures. registers a new blip. It is recorded as a moving vessel. The crew's calculations show her approaching from 17 miles ahead. The Stockholm is on course and in clear weather, running at her top speed of 18 knots. At 10.48, she picks up an approaching ship and calculates she is 12 miles ahead and slightly to starboard. At 11 o'clock, the distance is put at six miles by 11.03 at four. At 11.05, the Andrea Doria's captain determines the approaching Stockholm is five miles off. When two of his officers argue it's closer to three, the captain orders a slight turn to the left four degrees, calculating the two ships will make a starboard to starboard passing. At 11.06, the Stockholm, still in clear weather, nears the fog bank. Her estimates put the dory at two miles. The third mate orders a 20 degree turn to the right, calculating the ships will pass port to port. In reality, the ships are closing faster than their estimates, and the maneuver unknowingly puts them on a collision course. By the time the Andrea Doria breaks from the fog, it's too late to do anything. so badly only half her lifeboats can be launched. The lucky survivors search the sea for those not so lucky. Although the Stockholm's bow was ripped away on impact, she remains seaworthy and assists in the rescue operation. Helicopters arrive from New York City to help the injured survivors of the Andrea Doria. Going tug Cape Ann and the liner Ile de France arrive to finish the job of picking up survivors who line the deck wondering how such a disaster could have ever happened. And they, like others, would long wonder if there was any place truly safe from disaster. The most luxurious ship on the transatlantic run was in her death throes. She had been true to her brochures. She had provided her passengers with an experience they would never forget. the Italian fleet does not go quickly or dramatically, but gives up by degrees as the insistent waters fill her hull. At 10.09, the ship many call the most beautiful in the world takes her place in the graveyard of the Atlantic. The Ile de France is the first to reach New York with survivors. Last to arrive is the Stockholm, bearing a miracle. Ship's officers have discovered a young girl snatched from her bed aboard the Andrea Doria, still alive in the twisted wreckage of the Stockholm's bow.
As the stockroom docks in New York, relatives anxiously scan the railings, searching for their loved ones. Among them is actress Ruth Roman. She had handed her three-year-old son into a lifeboat, which then pulled away. Rescued later by the Ile de France, she still hasn't seen it. it's just beginning. Of the 1,706 aboard the Andrea Doria, 46 are lost. Aboard the Stockholm, five seamen are dead. It's a miracle the toll wasn't higher. To the grateful survivors and their loved ones, it was a day of joy. The recriminations and accusations would come later. The investigation that followed was inconclusive. Blame was never fixed, merely laid to human error. A fact that brought to most the sober realization that there is no place truly safe from disaster. Certainly, that was borne out by Texas City, a town whose own growth and success helped create the potential for disaster. The year is 1947. World War II has brought big industry, especially oil and chemicals. And in five years, the tiny city has swelled from five to 18,000. Part of Texas City's growth was due to the expanding chemical industry, which had grown up in close proximity to the city's docks. So did the tank farms of a number of the nation's most prominent oil companies. On April 16, 1947, three ships and a barge lie close to each other at the Texas City docks. One of those ships is the French freighter SS Grand Camp. Earlier, the Grand Camp had loaded its forward hold with a shipment of small arms ammunition. Now, the aft hold was being loaded with 2,300 tons of ammonium nitrate, a good, comparatively inexpensive fertilizer. But the normally safe fertilizer, when packed too tightly and exposed to heat, could become a lethal explosive. Signs throughout the ship prohibited smoking. But as fate would have it on this April 16th, one man chose to ignore those signs. And a disaster was in the making.
call for help goes out. Thousands are injured. There is no water or power, and a dangerous sulfur gas covers much of the area. Firefighters and emergency crews labor throughout the day to contain the fire. are found almost a mile away. Rail and pipelines have been ripped apart. The barge moored next to the Grand Camp is tossed 200 feet across land into a parking lot, and the lot itself has been turned into a junkyard. Even a light airplane flying over the area has been blasted out of the sky. within a one-mile radius of the explosion has collapsed. Virtually every window within two miles of the blast has been shattered. As far away as two miles, people driving in their cars are killed by the barrage of flying debris. The Red Cross organizes one of the largest emergency operations in history as cities up and down the coast rush help to the stricken survivors. Medicine, food, and clothing are airlifted to the devastated city. As the day wears on, fires still burn out of control, and the docks become a center of major concern. By nightfall, the situation is critical. The freighter SS High Flyer is also loaded with ammonium nitrate. Attempts to tow the freighter away from the dock have been fruitless. Finally, the inevitable happens. second day wears on, the fires are finally brought under control. But the pain and the suffering have only begun. and friends are still alive as the search for the missing and the dead goes on. The list of victims grows. Survivors pray they will not see the names of friends or loved ones. For those who do, it is an agonizing experience. service is held to mourn the more than 500 dead and to pray for the 4,000 injured. Many are still in shock over what has happened, numb with the realization of how unsafe their city really was and how their lives could be so drastically altered by one man's burning cigarette. They couldn't help but wonder if their city wasn't safe from man-made disaster, what city was. There are man-made things designed to prevent disaster. The Teton Dam in southern Idaho was one of them. Approved by Congress in 1964, the dam was to control the yearly spring runoff and stop the chronic flooding of the Snake River Valley. By early 1976, the dam is complete. By June 5th, it's almost full for the first time, forming a picturesque lake just as the engineers had planned. But at 8.30 a.m., something happens the engineers didn't plan. A small leak develops in the face of the dam, and a bulldozer is dispatched to fix it. Meanwhile, a second leak starts near the top of the dam. The 80 billion gallons of water trapped behind the dam exert tremendous pressure, and the leak expands so fast the bulldozer is helpless. 
Moments later, a section of the dam's face collapses. towns lie directly in the path of the rampaging wall of water. Warnings are flashed as the water spreads with destructive force. It overtakes the farm communities of Wilfred and Sugar City. are in danger from the floating debris. The water breaks through levees and canal banks, causing flooding in surrounding areas. Idaho Falls, 70 miles from the dam, gears up for the flood. As the water continues to rise, volunteers frantically try to channel its course. by the flood. The only light comes from abandoned buildings burning down to the waterline. By morning, the buildup of debris creates a new problem, and workers frantically try to relieve the pressure on several bridges. Dynamite is finally used to blast the channel and divert the pressure on the Broadway Bridge. The tactic works. The bridge is left battered but intact. By early Monday, the rampaging water thunders past the towns of Shelley and Firth toward Blackwood, whose lowlands pose a serious problem if the waters are not stopped. The hope for containment lies in the American Falls Reservoir just beyond Blackwood. Dam officials have been releasing water to make way for the rushing torrent. Now, as the raging waters pour into the reservoir, the question remains, will the dam hold, and can it contain the water to come? can be released gradually. After three days, the uncontrolled flooding is finally over, leaving in its wake miles of devastation and oozing, sticky, stinking mud. Hundreds of people have lost everything. Out of the disaster, people pick up and start anew. Eleven people lost their lives when the toll could have been in the hundreds. But still, what if this had happened at night? And why did it have to happen at all? Senator Frank Church had this comment on the dam. Uh, this dam was built according to the latest state of the art. Nothing like this should have happened. Nothing like this could have happened, except for some fatal flaw, either in the siting of the dam or in the design. Could that fatal flaw be simply that nothing made by man is ever truly safe from disaster? The residents of Sao Paulo, Brazil, were to discover just how true that was in a disaster whose horror would long be remembered. The year is 1974. Sao Paulo is riding a building boom that has carried its population over the six million mark. Already the size of Chicago, it has become the center of Brazil's economic explosion. Its modern skyscrapers soar upward, a triumph of technology, dazzling the eye and stirring the imagination. One of the most impressive is the Whalema building. Newly built, its bottom floors were devoted to parking, for the city's building code insisted on adequate parking for every new structure. Employees loved the building. It was a nice place to work. It had convenient parking facilities, modern elevators, and most importantly, on this hot, muggy August day, it had air conditioning. 
The unit, housed on the 12th floor for the sake of efficiency, labors through the morning to fight the oppressive heat. But near 2 o'clock, it overheats. shatters windows, allowing the air currents to sweep the flames upward. Before the elevators are immobilized by the flames, a few manage to escape. Others make it to the roof, where they find little help or chance of escape. Spectators line the street, watching helplessly, while those trapped try to find some way to escape the searing heat. to rig ropes from a nearby building and lead 18 people to safety before the ropes burn through.
the fire burns for four hours until there is nothing left to burn. For those who survive, it's a miracle. For the families of those who do not, it's a travesty. The final toll is 220 dead, burned, suffocated, or crumpled on the sidewalk. 250 more are in the hospital. Tragically, the same flammable plastic material used throughout the Whalma building is still being used today in many of America's finest office buildings, perhaps the one you work in. Few people seem concerned about preventing disasters until after they happen. But those few can make a difference when they wisely prepare for disaster. Even back in 1956, flying was safer than driving, and preparation for disaster was a standard procedure. October 15, 1956, a stratoclipper named the Sovereign of the Skies departs from Honolulu International Airport for San Francisco. Part of the takeoff routine is informing the passengers of standard emergency procedures. is airborne at 8.30 p.m. after an uneventful flight to Honolulu from Tokyo. The weather is clear, the forecast good. The 26 passengers aboard relax for what they assume will be another uneventful flight. The plane's captain, Richard Ogg, is a veteran pilot with 20 years flying experience. He takes flight 943 to 13,000 feet and levels off for the flight. Halfway between Hawaii and California, the U.S. Coast Guard cutter Poncher Train is patrolling a 210 square mile area known as Ocean Station November. The ship is assigned to gather weather data and give navigational aid to ships and aircraft, an assignment that is to link the Poncher Train to the fate of Flight 943. Aye, aye, sir. Will do. In command of the Poncher Train is Captain William Earle, a 40 year old veteran of the seas. As the ship nears the end of a three-week patrol, the crew's duties have become routine, even boring. But one of these duties is a drill, a precaution to hone the crew's skills should an aircraft be forced to ditch at sea. Nearing mid-Pacific, the flight plan calls for a climb to 21,000 feet. Number one tax gone crazy. By the number one. Suddenly, something goes wrong. Number one tachometer showed a tremendous increase in the RPM of number one engine, and it was obviously we, we had a runaway propeller. Will the prop stay on? It's too early to say. Ocean Station November, Captain. Ocean Station November, this is flight 943. Ocean Station November, flight 943 calling. Ocean Station November, flight 943. Can you give us a continuous beacon? Over. Roger, flight 9. The Baron for station November is 256 crew. The ship's crew knew this was no drill, that 
now the weeks of practice might have to be put to the test. And if they were, lives would be at stake. Getting soil pressure drop at number four. Over. Roger, 943. All ahead, flank. Aye, aye, sir. Sir, all ahead, flank. Both he and I have realized that this was a very critical condition. We all knew that as of the time of the ditching, there might be many casualties. I made every effort, of course, to reassure him that we had equipment, a team, and the facilities and manpower down below to do the best job possible in saving the people. As flares were sent up to guide the ship, Captain Og was weighing the dangers of the plane's runaway prop against the risks of a night ditching. After questioning the engineer about the likelihood of the propeller staying on there, I decided to circle the ship and wait for daylight, giving ourselves the advantage of daylight landing, plus using up our fuel to make the airplane far more floatable. by this foot guard ship here is inevitable. The ship is completely equipped to help us out in any emergency, and we have aboard here life rafts and all equipment to make a safe landing at sea. We think we can remain aloft until daylight, however, and we'll probably land shortly after dawn by this ship. In the meantime, Please follow the instructions of your cabin personnel. As the plane circles for the people on board and the crew of the puncher train, the tense waiting begins. For the passengers of Flight 943, it is a strained vigil and prayers are shared. Captain Og prepares his passengers for what is to come. His experience, his air of confidence, his calm manner, all help to reassure the passengers. The one thing he wants most is to avoid panic. Every ship within reach races toward Ocean Station November. But only the puncture train is there and ready. the crew receives their final instructions from their officers. The men are well trained and ready. A layer of foam is laid down to mark the ditch heading. We were busy, of course, but I did have time to search my memory for every scrap of information that would be of help to us in this landing at sea. The tail of the airplane would come off on impact. This prompted me to remove the passengers from that part of the airplane. Wind three and a half knots from northwest. Sailing 3,000 feet. Wave height one to two feet in gentle continuous pattern from windward. of 31 people rested in the hands of the pilot, Captain Og. There could be no mistakes, no second chances. There'll be some people coming out of both wing exits, and some out the cabin door. There'll be children coming out first. Roger, Flight 943. Ocean 8 November, this is Flight 943. We're definitely coming in this time. One minute now to impact. One minute to dig now. 135 knots. 10 degree flat.
everyone has followed instructions, and Captain Og has managed a miracle against incalculable odds. No one is lost. There are only a few minor injuries. A major disaster has been prevented because man had the foresight, the skill, and the luck to avoid it. But still, we are slow to learn. We go about our daily lives facing a hundred small aggravations. We haven't time to think about big disasters because we have so many small ones. But we don't often find time to consider that in our quest for the good life, we are paying a price. The new potentials for disaster are increasing, slowly, insidiously. And while they provide us with the things that make for the good life, they also provide dangers, many of which may become a threat to our very existence. The disasters of nature will always be with us, and disasters made by man are increasing. Both have one thing in common, the next victim could be you.